one of those nominations. Votes on the other two National Labor Relations Board nominees are possible today. Later in the day, we're expecting the Senate to continue work on a spending bill for transportation and housing programs. The Senate, live on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order, and the chaplain retired Admiral Barry Black will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Sovereign Master of the Universe, your kingdom cannot be shaken, for you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We praise you that more things are wrought by prayer than this world can imagine. Lord, thank you for inviting us to ask and receive to seek and find, and to knock for doors to open. Forgive us when we have forfeited your blessings because of our failure to ask. Forgive us also when we have lacked the humility to turn from evil, to seek your face, and to pursue your paths. May this prayer that opens today's session be a springboard for intercession throughout this day. Help our senators to pause repeatedly during their challenging work to ask you for wisdom and guidance. We pray in your merciful name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. Following your remarks of Senator McConnell and me, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the nomination of calendar number 223, the nomination of Kent Hirozawa of New York to be a member of the National Labor Relations Board and immediately have a closure vote on that nomination. I am told that H.R. 2218 is at the desk and due for another reading. The, the clerk will read the title of the bill for the second time. H.R. 2218, an act to amend Subtitle D of the Solid Waste Disposal Act, and so forth. I would now object any further proceedings, Mr. President, at this time. Objection, sir. Bill will be placed on the calendar. Mr. President, for the first time in three years, the Senate is poised to confirm members of the National Labor Relations Board. Although too few Americans are aware of the important job this board does, the NLRB looks out for the rights of millions of U.S. workers every day and remedies unfair practices by private companies. This board is an important safeguard for workers in America, regardless of whether the employees are union or non-union. Without the work of the NLRB, employees who have been cheated and treated unfairly would have no entity to address the wrongs. Union elections would be meaningless to employers and employees. Labor abuses and unfair employment practices could go unchallenged. So I'm glad that the Senate's moving forward as agreed under the process so forth at the beginning of this Congress to confirm five nominees to the NRB, two Republicans and three Democrats. The Senate will consider three Democratic nominees and two Republican nominees today. Once they're confirmed, the NRB will have five Senate confirmed members for the first time in a decade. The five nominees are all eminently qualified. For example, Mark Prears has served on the National Labor Relations Board for the last three years. He has served as chairman since 2011. He was a founding partner of a Buffalo, New York law firm where he practiced employment law. He previously worked in Buffalo in the regional office of the NLRB. He received his bachelor's degree from Cornell and his law degree from SUNY Buffalo. Kent Harazawa, whose nomination will be considered also today, is currently chief counsel for the NLRB. Before joining that 
prestigious board in 2010. He was a partner in a New York law firm where he worked on federal, state, and labor and employment law. He was he served as field attorney for the NLRB for three years prior to entering private practice. He has a bachelor's degree from Yale and his law degree from NYU. Nancy Schiffer, the third Democratic NLRB nominee, will consider today serve as associate general counsel for the American Federation of Labor and, and the CIO, Mr. President. She's also worked for United Auto Workers and served as staff attorney in the Detroit Regional Office for NLRB. Ms. Schiffer received her bachelor's degree from Michigan State and her law degree from the University of Michigan. Once we vote on three Democratic nominees, I expect we'll consider the two Republican nominees by consent. The first Republican nominee, Harry Johnson, is a partner in Los Angeles, a prestigious Los Angeles law firm and practices labor and employment law. Mr. Johnson received his bachelor's degree from Johns Hopkins University and his law degree from Harvard. The other Republican nominee, Philip Ms. Camara, is a partner in the Chicago law firm where he also practiced labor and employment law. He received his bachelor's degree from Duquesne and his MBA and JD from the University of Pennsylvania. These nominees will be responsible for ensuring fair compensation working conditions for American workers. Look at the resumes of these five people, Mr. President. They're pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. They're experienced and dedicated public servants, and I have no doubt they'll perform their duties at this crucial board with distinction. Mr. President, the Republican leader. Today, the president will continue his campaign road tour in Chattanooga. We hear he plans to make an announcement about corporate taxes. And while I understand he's looking for headlines here, reports indicate that the policy he intends to announce doesn't exactly qualify as news. It's just a further left version of a widely panned plan he already proposed two years ago, this time with extra goodies for tax and spend liberals. The plan, which I just learned about last night, lacks meaningful bipartisan input, and the tax hike it includes is going to dampen any boost business might otherwise get to help our economy. In fact, it could actually hurt small businesses, and it represents an unmistakable signal that the president has literally backed away from his campaign era promise to corporate America that tax reform would be revenue neutral to them. Not only is this a rebuke to one of his party's most senior senators, the Finance Committee chairman, it also represents a serious blow to one of the best chances for true bipartisan action here in Washington. I truly hope the President reconsiders this plan and consults with Congress before moving any further. Now, on a different matter, two summers ago, Republicans and Democrats came together to agree on a set of spending caps for the following decade. President Obama agreed to it, as did leaders of both parties in the Senate and in the House. It was essentially a promise made to the American people that Washington would reduce spending by $2.1 trillion. And I was happy to help lead that effort. Well, two years later, Democrats are now trying to find ways to literally walk away from the promise we made. They're pressing to abandon the 2011 agreement in favor of higher spending, as evidenced by appropriation bills like the one we're considering this week, which actually hikes up spending by double digits. And the president is now actually threatening to veto bills that live up to the commitment we all made together two years ago. Let me repeat that. The President of the United States, who during the campaign took credit for the very savings Democrats now want to walk away from, is threatening to veto spending bills that would actually follow the law and live up to the commitment he himself signed. This represents a stunning shift for Democrats who just recently were warning against breaking the agreement. The chairwoman of the Budget Committee said last year that we have to be able to count on agreements that have been made instead of threatening a government shutdown. Yet that's just what she and her party are now threatening to do, to shut down the government unless an agreement we all made is literally torn up and thrown away. So if Democrats want to shut down the government because they can't wiggle their way out of a deal they agreed to, I guess there isn't much we can do to stop them. But Republicans intend to stick by the commitments we made to our constituents. Now that having been said, 
There's also this to remember. Republicans have always said there may be more effective, effective ways to achieve comparable spending reductions. And if Democrats want to propose smarter spending cuts that achieve the same kind of savings they committed to back in 2011, well, we're ready to listen. Comprehensive government spending reforms would be a good place to start because Republicans understand that America's largest fiscal challenges stem from the fact that programs our fellow Americans hope to rely on in their most vulnerable years are going bankrupt. And Republicans are saying that the only way to avert that kind of panicked, poorly thought out spending cuts and tax increases we've seen in Europe is to implement forward-looking reforms today. That's why it's always so amusing when the President and his allies try to brand the kind of innovative government spending reforms we favor as European-style austerity, as he implied again this weekend. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. What the Europeans are doing in response to the threats from their creditors is essentially the opposite of the approach favored by Republicans. This, the type of long-term spending reforms we envision are, only, are often the only anecdote against the kind of austerity we see in Europe. Because European austerity isn't about protecting future generations from spending cuts. It's about staying afloat today. Today. And the tax increases Europeans enact under duress and the kind of pain Detroiters experience under bankruptcy, these are exactly the things Republicans aim to avoid. And we aim to avoid those things by acting intelligently today while we still have the time. And unlike Democrats, Republicans aren't looking for some colorless discussion about raising taxes here or snipping there or moving numbers around on a budget chart. We'd rather have a more holistic, forward-looking conversation, one about modernizing government to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Where we ask questions like this, how do we modernize entitlement programs so they'll actually be accessible to Americans when they need them? Which government programs should be reformed, updated, or no longer make sense in the 21st century economy? How can services be delivered in a more efficient and technologically savvy way? And what structural reforms can we implement to ensure the most robust economic growth and job creation for this generation and for those to come? By addressing the big questions now, by identifying and implementing forward-looking reforms today, we can do a lot more than just reduce the deficit in the short term. We can also create jobs now, grow the economy now, make government work better now, and eliminate the threat of a debt crisis everyone knows is heading our way. A debt crisis that would usher in the very kind of European-style austerity Democrats claim to like, but keep accelerating, claim not to like, but keep accelerating exactly toward. But in order for this to happen, the Democrats need to work with us. As a first step, they should step back from the brink with their plan to shut down the government, and they need to stop threatening to tear up agreements we all previously assented to. The Budget Control Act might not be perfect, but at least we were able to secure important spending control for the American people. And if Democrats want to trade some savings for innovative reforms, that can serve our country even better over the long term, then there are plenty policymakers ready to listen. But Republicans are not going to just give up on commitments made to our constituents. Not only would that be a betrayal of a promise we all made, but we've already seen where the Democrats' left-leaning policies and European-inspired ideas lead. And more of that is the last thing our country needs right now. I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Uh, under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider uh, uh, the, to the following nomination, which the clerk will report. Nomination. National Labor Relations Board. Kent Yoshiho Hirozawa of New York to be a member. Under the previous order, the clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture.
Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close debate on the nomination of Kent Yoshiho Hirozawa of New York to be a member of the National Labor Relations Board, signed by 17 senators. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on the nomination of Kent Yoshi Yoshiho um, Hirozawa of New York to be a member of the National Labor Relations Board for the term of five years expiring August 27, 2016, shall be brought to a close. The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Baucus, Mr. Beckage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr. It's been a while since over there. You haven't been in the chair for a while, right? Ms. Cantwell. Mr. Carden. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Chiesa. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coburn. Mr. Cochran. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Donnelly. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. <laughs> Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Flake. Mr. Franken. Mrs. Gillibrand. Um, no. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mrs. Hagen. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Heinrich. Ms. Heitkamp. Mr. Heller. Ms. Hirono. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Inhofe. Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Kane, Mr. King, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Landrieu, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey. Both sides. Mr. McCain. Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, 
Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Paul. Mr. Portman. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Risch. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott. Mr. Sessions. Mrs. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Tester. You're a man. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Baucus, Boxer, Cardin, Hagan, Markey, McCain, McConnell, Mikulski, Sanders, and Warren. Senators voting in the negative. Cornyn, Cruz, and Paul. Mr. Risch, no. Ms. Landrew, aye. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Grassley, no. Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Corker, aye.
Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby. No. Mr. Johans. No. Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Vitter. No. Mr. Donnelly. Aye. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Mr. Durbin. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Chambliss, no. Mr. Coburn, no. Mr. Leahy, Mr. Leahy, aye. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden, aye. Mr. Alexander, Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Reed of Nevada, aye. Mr. Heinrich, aye. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, no. Mr. Barrasso, no. Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Tester, aye. Mr. Udall of New Mexico, aye. <laughs> Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Franken, aye. Yeah, you're Mr. Burr, no. Mrs. Murray, aye. Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott, no. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schatz, aye. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, aye. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, no. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi, no. Mr. Cochran, Mr. Cochran, no. Mr. Isaacson, no. Mr. Toomey, no.
Mr. Rubio, no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Flake, aye. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, aye. Ms. Hirono, aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Hatch, Mr. Hatch, no. Mr. Kane, aye. Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Pryor, aye. <laughs> 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 Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, no. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Rockefeller, aye. Ms. Klobuchar, Aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Ayotte, aye. How are you doing? Mr. Crapo, no. Mr. Coates, no. Mr. Beckage, aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. So I guess it sounds like it wasn't working.
Mr. Hoven, no. Mr. Moran, no. Mrs. McCaskill, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Sessions, no. Mr. Johnson, South Dakota, aye. Mr. Harkin, Mr. Harkin, aye. Mr. Brown, aye. Mr. Heller, no. of Colorado, aye. Mr. Inhofe, no. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, no. Mr. Kirk, no. Ms. Cantwell, aye. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, aye. Mr. Levin, aye. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, aye. Mr. King, Mr. King, aye. Mr. Portman, no. Mr. Schumer, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, aye.
Mr. Bozeman, now. Are there any other senators wishing to vote or wishing to change their vote? Uh, if not, then on this vote, the yeas are 64, the nays are 34, three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn have voted in the affirmative. The motion is agreed to. Cloture having been invoked, pursuant to Senate Resolution 15 of the 113th Congress, there will now be up to eight hours of post-cloture consideration of the nomination, equally divided in the usual form. Mr. President, the Senator from Iowa is recognized. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I understand that we are now on uh, post-closure debate on uh, this nominee. I understand there's up to eight hours that can be consumed by that, if I'm not mistaken. Is the that... Senator is correct. Well, I certainly hope we don't have to take that much time. I hope that uh, this nominee and the other the other four to follow. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can get through those today uh, and, uh, and get the board, get these uh, nominees uh, down to the president uh, before we leave here this evening. Uh, Mr. President, today is a day that I and many of my colleagues have long waited for. Because of the bipartisan deal that was reached on the president's nominees, it looks like we finally have a path forward. Uh, to confirm a full slate of nominees to the National, Relation, N National Labor Relations Board. A fully confirmed, fully functional board will be a huge step forward for workers, employers, and our country, and this will be the first time in over a decade that this has happened. Over 75 years ago, Congress enacted the National Labor Relations Act, guaranteeing American workers the right to form and join a union and to bargain for a better life. For both union and non-union workers alike, the Act provides for essential protections. It gives workers a voice in the workplace, allowing them to join together and speak up for fair wages and good benefits and safe working conditions. These rights ensure that the people who do the real work in this country see the benefits when our economy grows and aren't mistreated or put at risk on their job. The National Labor Relations Board is the guardian of these fundamental rights. Workers themselves cannot enforce the National Labor Relations Act. The board is the only place workers can go if they've been treated unfairly and denied the basic protections that the law provides. Thus, the board plays a vital role in vindicating workers' rights. In the past 10 years, the NLRB has secured opportunities for reinstatement for 22,544 employees who were unjustly fired. It has also recovered more than $1 billion on behalf of workers whose rights were violated in the last decade. Now, the board doesn't just protect the rights of workers and unions. It also provides relief and remedies to our nation's employers. The board is an employer's only recourse 
if a union commences a wildcat strike or refuses to bargain in good faith during negotiations. The NLRB also helps numerous businesses resolve disputes efficiently. For example, when two unions picketed Walmart in 2012, Walmart filed a claim with the NLRB and the NLRB negotiated a settlement. So by preventing labor disputes that could disrupt our economy, the work that the board does is vital to every worker and every business across the nation. Earlier this year, I received a letter from 32 management side and 15 union side labor attorneys from across the country that made this point particularly well. It urged the swift confirmation of a full package of five NLRB nominees and said, and I quote, while we differ in our views over the decisions and actions of the NLRB over the years, we do agree that our clients' interests are best served by the stability and certainty that a full confirmed board will bring to the field of labor management relations, end quote. I couldn't agree more. Confirming these nominees swiftly is vitally important because the National Labor Relations Board must have a quorum of three board members to act. If there are less than three board members at any time, the board cannot issue decisions and essentially must shut down. Although the board currently has three members, Chairman Pierce's term expires on August the 27th, next month. At that point, the Labor Board would be unable to function unless we confirm additional members. Now that's more than just an administrative headache, it would be a tragedy that denies justice to working men and women across the country. So it's imperative that we act to avoid this and keep the board open for work. Now, Mr. President, up until recent times, all of us here in Congress agreed that the board should function for the good of our country and our economy. But in the last few years, that understanding has broken down. As I said, it's been a decade since the board has had five Senate-confirmed members. It's not that qualified people haven't been nominated, because they have. The problem is, is that a few of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I'm not saying everyone, but a very vocal minority, have been trying to use the nominations process to undermine the mission of the National Labor Relations Board. They first of all don't like the National Labor Relations Act, but they know that they could never repeal it outright. So what's their solution, this vocal minority on the Republican side? Keep the NLRB inoperable by refusing to confirm nominees regardless of their qualifications. In this case, one of my Republican colleagues announced his intention to filibuster NLRB nominees six days before the nominations were announced. And he openly admitted that his intention was to shut down the agency. Now we've seen lots of nominees deemed unacceptable simply because they've worked on behalf of workers or union or unions and they support our system of collective bargaining. These nominees have been accused of being biased and called unfit to serve because they worked for labor unions or, or were lawyers for labor unions. But I'd like to point out what the National Labor Relations Act, the law, actually says. I've often quoted from the National Labor Relations Act on this point, and I will do so again right now. Here's what the law says, and I quote, it is declared to be the policy of the United States to eliminate the causes of certain substantial obstructions to the free flow of commerce and to mitigate and eliminate these obstructions when they have occurred by encouraging the practice and procedure of collective bargaining and by protecting the exercise by workers 
of full freedom of association, self-organization, and designation of representatives of their own choosing for the purpose of negotiating the terms and conditions of their employment or other mutual aid or protection." End quote. That's what the law says. The purpose is, again, to encourage the practice and procedure of collective bargaining for the good of our workers, for the good of our economy, for the good of our nation. So, if you have a nominee that comes up that's for the, for the board that supports collective bargaining, I would think that nominee would be more qualified, not less qualified, to serve on the board because that nominee understands what the law says. So we should be seeking nominees who are, in the words of one of the nominees before us today, not pro-union, not pro-worker, or pro-management, but pro-act. Pro-act. And if you are pro-act, the act says that we should be encouraging the practice and procedure of collective bargaining. And by protecting the exercise by workers of full freedom of association, self-organization, and designation of representatives of their own choosing. That's what the law says. Now, I'm optimistic that the nominees before us today will bring this perspective to their work at the board. All five nominees have diverse backgrounds and are deeply steeped in labor and employment law. Now, while I certainly don't agree with the politics or perhaps the ideology of each nominee, it cannot be disputed that this is a competent and experienced group of lawyers. Given their diverse backgrounds and qualifications, there is no reason that this package of nominees should not be confirmed with strong bipartisan support. All five of these nominees have been thoroughly vetted. While for the two most recent nominees, Kent Hirazawa and Nancy Schiffer, the vetting process has been quick, but it has been thorough. They have submitted all of the paperwork that we receive for our nominees. They have appeared before our committee in a hearing, answered any questions. They have met with staff for both sides, and they have answered all the written questions posed by members of my committee. They have demonstrated themselves to be impressively qualified and capable, and I look forward to their future service on the board. So I believe the time has come to start a new chapter for the NLRB. It's time to ratchet down the political rhetoric that has recently haunted this agency and let the dedicated public servants who work there do their jobs. Indeed, I hope today's votes mark a new beginning for the board with a new energy and vitality, a new spirit of collaboration. A revitalized NLRB is a critical part of our continued efforts to rebuild a strong economy and a strong middle class. It's long past time to put the board back in business and to tone down the rhetoric. I say to my friends on the other side, again, a vocal minority, um, certainly they can vote against the nominees. I, that, that's, that's their right. That's their privilege. Uh, but don't, don't use the nomination process to try to shut down the board or to thwart the, the uh, implementation of the National Labor Relations Act. Certainly, uh, uh, I'm sure there are, there are times when the board had a, a majority of the board were appointed by Republican presidents that were probably more pro-management. I can't think of one right now, but I'm sure that they probably made some decisions that I would not be in favor of but they did it openly. Um, and there are times when, under a Democratic president when the board would probably have three members that would be more from the labor side than management side. But that's the ebb and flow. And quite frankly, uh, for most of the times in the past, even though uh, Republican presidents had put nominees on the board that were probably more pro-management or came from the management side, 
they'd have three of those and then two from the worker or labor side. They still ran the board in a nonpartisan fashion. Uh, they reached agreements uh, in open fashion that were uh, implementing the, the, the late Na National Labor Relations Act. Uh, I would be hard pressed to think of a time when the board acted in contradiction to what the act actually says. Uh, but until recently, and this has just broken down in the last few years when President Obama's nominees to the board in the first instance were filibustered, uh, when the president had the recess appointment, give recess appointments to nominees, and of course a recess appointment can only last so long and then that person has to leave the board. And as I said, there was a uh, threat uh, by a member on the Republican side to filibuster nominees before they were even sent down. That means the board would have been unable to operate. Uh, and so the president then gave a recess appointment uh, to two nominees to keep the board functioning. Uh, that then found its way into the courts. Uh, we have a couple of courts that decided the president didn't have the power to do a recess appointment the way he did it. Other courts have taken different pathways, so that, that set of facts in that case is winding its way to the Supreme Court, probably be, will be decided sometime next year. But that's what happens when, when people don't let nominees who are fully qualified, fully qualified, come to the floor to get an up or down vote. So I'm very pleased that in this agreement that was reached a couple of weeks ago uh, to not filibuster nominees included the National Labor Relations Board. So we have an agreement from the Republican side that they will not filibuster these nominees. We have five of them. Uh, this is the first, Mr. Hirozawa. And uh, I'm hopeful that again, since they've been thoroughly vetted, that we can move ahead expeditiously to vote on them and that we won't take the full eight hours uh, to, to debate these nominees and that uh, for each one of them, each one would have eight hours. But hopefully we can collapse that and have the votes on the nominees uh, sometime later this afternoon. And as I said, turn a new chapter in the NLRB. Put them down there, get the board, and let them do their work and uh, tone down the political rhetoric a little bit uh, on the National Labor Relations Board. So with that, Mr. President, uh, I request unanimous consent that a legal fellow in Senator Blumenthal's office, Afton Sissel, be granted four privileges for the duration of July 30th, 2013. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent Time during all post-closure quorum calls on the Harazawa nomination be charged equally to both sides. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I yield the floor and I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. The Senator from Nebraska. Mr. President, I ask uh, unanimous consent that the quorum call be set aside. Without objection, so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that I be allowed to speak about five minutes as, in, uh, as if in morning business. Without objection.